way the boss decided to let us use uh, the embassy car to go to lunch in the day. It's nice of him. He's a real sweetheart. He's really nice. Is this a regular hangout for you guys now? No, we use, time, we use to eat there on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Do they have a special on those days? No, we just go over there on Tuesdays and Thursdays and eat. Because we're usually somewhere in that area. But it is safe to go over there. Well, it's kind of a rough area, but the food's worth it. Viene el carro allá para acá, viene para tu lado, están bien con miedo, tuvo que ser retirado ya. Bueno, estoy listo. Charlie, when we get through with lunch, we need to get together with our counterparts to see what we're going to do about taking off that Colossus organization. Okay. Sounds like a nice place we're going to go eat. I'm just uh, a little concerned about the area we're going in. Well, the area is rough, but the food is excellent. I'm make it worthwhile then. I'll take a shortcut. We always take it on that corner. Alístate. Ya me está pasando el auto. Bueno, ya vienen. Listo. Geez, y'all weren't kidding. This is a bad part of town. How much farther is it? Well, it's not that much farther. Uh, it's just around the corner. What did you do to drive? Being an American and being a DEA special agent in a foreign country makes you a target. Mix it with narcotics and terrorism, and you have a formula that can easily explode. Of heightened concern to DEA is the increasing use of terrorist tactics by drug traffickers to attain limited political objectives. These goals include the relaxation of enforcement efforts against them, or the prevention of further extradition. This new development poses a significant threat to U.S. interests and to the stability of elected governments in drug source countries. As we become more successful in combating the drug trade, the level of violence and threats of violence have increased. Drug law enforcement has always been a high-risk activity. But this escalated violence goes far beyond the normal anticipated danger involved in drug investigations. Various terrorist and insurgent groups are either directly or indirectly involved in drug trafficking. Beginning in the 1970s, many of these groups began to generate funds through drug-related activities. Within the last 10 years, DEA has received information on the involvement of several Colombian terrorist groups in the drug trade. The two groups most prominently mentioned are the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, commonly known as FARC, and the 19th of April Movement, or M-19. In March of 1984, Colombian authorities raided a group of cocaine laboratories in the Tranquilandia area of Colombia and seized 10 tons of cocaine and cocaine base. 
While landing on a clandestine airstrip, the authorities engaged in a firefight with approximately 30 people in fatigue-type uniforms. These people are believed to be members of the FARC. Follow-up operations in the remote Llanos area of Colombia uncovered a FARC camp within one half mile of the traffickers' cocaine laboratory site. Terrorists are conducting their operations and are making money. Narcotics for cash and weapons. For many years, terrorist groups have committed acts of violence for supposed political reasons. It is well-planned violence, dedicated action by well-trained people who struggle to stimulate fear, political disorder, and world revolution. Terrorists attack quickly, efficiently, and very destructively. Terrorism is the calculated use of violence to attain goals, often political or ideological in nature, through instilling fear, intimidation, or coercion. It involves a criminal act sometimes symbolic, but always intended to influence the audience beyond the immediate victim. Terrorist violence makes headlines, gets magazine copy, finds a place in the six o'clock news, and reaches a large audience which is almost always more important than the victim. For example, the 11 Israeli athletes who died in Munich were the immediate victims of terrorism. But the true intended target was the estimated one billion people who were watching the Olympics on TV. In an age of mass communications, such tactics are relatively cheap, effective, and produce a maximum of media exposure. Terrorist groups have perspectives, long-range objectives, ideologies, areas or operations, and tight internal organization. Terrorist operations do not simply happen. They, in fact, are highly organized. Terrorists go through intensive study in classrooms or schools, individual physical and mental conditioning, study and field exercises in weapons and explosives, political indoctrination, study exercises on both general and specific combat tactics and techniques, exercises in tradecraft or spy against spy techniques, operations in psychological warfare, survival training, and overt and clandestine communication instruction is given to each terrorist. It might surprise you to learn that training for terrorist fighters may last up to a full year, while leaders are often trained for as much as four years. Terrorist training is a continuous process for all who join the cause. Training is conducted internally by group members and externally by non-group members at international training camps. Terrorists commit a wide range of violent acts. They include vehicle bombings, office or restaurant bombings, arson, skyjackings, hijackings, assassinations, hostage barricades, kidnappings, raids, ambushes, maimings, such as the use of acid and the breaking of kneecaps. It is a fact that even in today's world of new technology and sophisticated equipment, there is not a single weapon that can combat terrorism. The only way to combat terrorism is through knowledge and understanding of what goes into the planning of a terrorist operation. This series of programs is on terrorism. We hope to highlight what terrorism is, what the goals of terrorists are, how you can reduce your vulnerability, and some survival techniques to assist you if you are taken hostage. In this series of programs, we are going to provide you with the knowledge and understanding you need to successfully build a defense mechanism that will enable you to conduct your mission while protecting yourself and your family. Our first segment will focus on important points to remember when living in a foreign country.
Make every effort to learn about the country you're going to the moment you get your new assignment. Once in the country, continue to obtain information from the U.S. Embassy, the resident DEA special agent, the RSO briefings, the embassy military attaches, and the host country employees. Uh, the other topic I'd like to talk to you about is travel in and about our uh, area, our country area. Before you travel to another area outside the specific area we're in, you need to get a detailed security briefing from the security officer. Um, if you give us five or six days notice, we can uh, pull the country you're going to and give you a detailed description of the local customs, local habits, and uh, the local population so that you may blend in. And you can also be aware of specific dangers and uh, activities located in the country you're going to. Reconnaissance and familiarization with your new environment is important. I, uh, I don't spend too much time down here unless I definitely have to. This is a real nice area to move into. Very nice. The houses are real good size. Low crime area. The local police that come up here a lot and patrol the area is very nice. No problems at all up in here. This place looks really great. Yeah, you really like it. It's a uh, excellent location. Whether accompanied by your family or on individual duty assignment, one of your first responsibilities will be the selection of a residence. Select a residence with security factors which have prevention impact on terrorist actions against you. Security in the residence has four major elements. One, site selection. Two, behavioral aspects. Three, personnel aspects. Four, physical security. Let's look first at site selection. Compare your living quarter options with your security needs. This home is isolated. It gives you a high profile because it will require a high degree of security to make it safe. Compare this home with living in individual homes in a neighborhood of Americans or other third world country nationals. Cluster living will provide you with an even greater degree of safety. Apartment living offers the benefit of close neighbors, limited entry and exits, and semi-public access to the lobby. Construction considerations should include strength of masonry and woodwork for strong, solid materials. Limit the number of entrances, but have more than one way to enter and exit. Hey, how you doing? I hear some of the neighbors right here. This is uh, oh, okay. Bill and Sherry. They're right next door here. Hey there, this is uh, Charlie. Good to see you. Charlie How are you doing? Nice to meet you. How you doing? Yeah. Looks like a safe neighborhood yeah. that you have here. Yeah, yeah. Hi, Lauren. Yeah, we're looking at the house. We really like it here. We're going to miss our man here, but uh, I see him go too. Yeah. But, uh, we're almost hit. done. Hi, Lauren. Good neighbors. Proximity to police stations. Adequacy of good outdoor lighting. The economic status of those who live near you can establish an ideal clustered residential area where mutual support can ease security problems. Now, let's look at residential security and the behavioral aspects of that protection. By behavioral aspects, we mean the variance of you and your family routines, control of the residence when absence, escape and evasion routes, and communication habits and procedures. Talk to your family. Make sure they realize the difference between stateside and foreign country living. Family patterns and routines should be varied, particularly if your assignment is in a high-risk area. It is your responsibility to make sure your family is informed. Now, we use this radio in case we need any help here at the house either while I'm gone or while mommy's gone, the two of you can use the radio too. If the home is equipped with an emergency radio, every member of the family must know the call signs, code words, and how to operate the set. The radio should be kept in a secure place, and a decision will have to be made 
whether to let your servants know where the radio is kept and whether to train them in its use. Remember that children are often ignored during serious incidents. And if they know how to use the radio, they may be able to obtain help. Work out a personal distress system, which should go only to the embassy. Control your residence when you or your family are absent for any period of time. Have someone pick up your mail each day. If you have daily newspaper delivery, have it discontinued or arrange with a neighbor to pick it up daily. Arrange to have lawn care services continue on a regular basis, regardless of your absence. Turn the ringer on your telephone down to the off position. Disconnect the instrument so unanswered ringing will not be heard by outsiders. Have a recorder connected to the phone so that you can record a call that might be suspect. When you depart, your automobile should be in the garage, out of sight and locked or if that's not possible, parked in a well-lighted area. <coughs> Intrusion devices and alarm systems should operate on batteries rather than electrical power. Be sure batteries are fresh and the system is turned on. Use commercial timers to turn your house lights on and off while you're away. A backup system using photoelectric switches should also be considered. Escape and evasion routes should be known and rehearsed by the entire family, both in daytime and nighttime conditions. Have primary and alternate routes out of the house, leading to a rally point. Portable rope ladders or ropes should be ready for use so escape is possible if terrorists break into the house. If you are unable to get out, immediately take refuge in your designated safe haven room. Know the routes, the rally points, the plans, the actions to take. Police, fire department, emergency, and ambulance service numbers should be available at each phone, and all the family should know how to request those services in both English and the language of the country. Answer the phone with a hello and identify the calling party before giving your name or other information. Never reveal that family members are on a trip. When I do, I'll call you and we'll meet somewhere and I'll give you the information that, that he gave me. And it sounds like just briefly that uh, the guy's going to be a valuable asset to us in this case. Recognize that your phone could possibly be tapped by kidnappers. Be most discreet concerning travel, movement, schedules, or business matters. Make sure all family members, as well as servants, know the location of a neighbor's phone or a public telephone near your home for emergency use. What I'd like to do is tomorrow is to bring my children with me mm -hmm. and point out the locations in your house where the phone is so that they'll sure. know exactly where it is. Great, That's, that'll be fine. Good. Work out in advance code words to use over the telephone to indicate you need help. Designate a color or a food or a name. Anything you may select, but make sure all in the house know the code word means a request for emergency help. Work out a series of overt and covert signals for assistance from neighbors. It could be shades pulled down in the house or any system which your imagination conceives and your neighbor understands. Communication systems and signals for emergency situations are vital and mandatory safety precautions. You must have these measures in place before an incident. Terrorism allows little experimentation and ad-libbed warnings can provoke instant violence. Now, let's talk about personnel aspect of residential protection. Domestic employees can be a vulnerability or a positive contribution to the security posture of a household. A security check must be made on every servant, ideally before actual employment. Ask them which company that they're from, and then go to the telephone and verify through calling that company to see if we were expecting them. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
servants must be briefed on visitor control. But don't discuss duress codes or evacuation systems with them. Brief your servants on procedures for answering the phone and insist that they give no information of any kind. Be sure you have all servants and employees report any suspicious or unusual activity to you immediately. Do not treat them as family members. de la compañía de gas, venga a componerle la estufa. Ah, sí, un momentito, déjeme revisar algo. Have your servants answer the door, rather than members of the household. Instruct the servant not to admit strangers, such as people claiming to be repairmen, or even policemen, without specific approval. If identification is required, do not use the phone number the person gives you. Call the company in the phone book. Make sure your servants follow this procedure. Doors should not be unlocked or opened until the visitors have been identified. And this means you have a responsibility to inform your servant of approved visitors, their probable time of arrival, the purpose of their visit, and any other details that would allow your servant to meet your security expectations. Host country agencies are often helpful in arranging for private guards, retired or off-duty policemen, and soldiers. Coordinate any actions of this nature with your embassy security office. ¿Quién es? Aquí le traigo un paquete para el señor de la casa. ¿De dónde viene? Del correo. Instruct your servants to refuse packages and mail, both should come through the embassy system where the staff is trained and equipped to recognize suspicious packages and mail. There are numerous instances where both mail and packages have contained explosives. Maintenance personnel should not be allowed to enter your house unless they have been security cleared and prior appointments made. Your servant should check their IDs and have confirmation from you before their admission. Know your neighbors. Neighbors in a foreign country almost become family, and they watch out for each other. Awareness and security aspects are enhanced with a block warning system, overt and covert signals, and consistent communication with each other. Personal discretion is important here. Evaluate your neighbors carefully. The elements of residential protection related to physical security are many. The most important factor of physical security is weapons. For you personally, this means an absolute knowledge of the laws in your assigned country as they pertain to possession of weapons and the legal use of deadly force. Keys are important. Keep all keys under tight control and accountability. Do not leave house keys on auto key rings while the car is being repaired or parked. Do not hide keys outside the house. Change locks if a key is lost or stolen or before you move into a previously occupied residence. Do not give keys to domestic employees. Key activated deadbolt locks and safety chains should be placed on exterior doors to the home and used. Door hinges should be heavy duty and located on the inside of the door. Wide angle peephole devices, preferably with one-way glass, should be considered for all exterior doors. Care must be taken when looking through the devices since ice picks could be jammed into your eye the moment you look through it. Don't touch the door handle. Look first. If you don't recognize the party, move away before you answer. Don't open the door until you are sure you are safe. Heavy window shutters with inside locks should be closed at dusk. 
Drapes on windows should be heavy and drawn at night. If possible, you should select and prepare a safe room haven for use as a safe area in case of an attack. Emergency supplies should be stored, as well as a portable radio with its own charger for communication purposes. The door should be sturdy and capable of barricade, with entrance only from the interior of the house. It should be a place to wait out any intruders until help arrives. You should consider the possibility of an emergency egress exit for use in the event the intruders try to burn you out. Canned food and bottled water should be stored in your safe haven and used only in an emergency. Guard dogs can provide excellent early warning to intruders. However, they should receive routine training. It doesn't matter if you have a big dog or a little dog as long as it is a loud dog. Iron grills or heavy screens should be considered in high threat areas with special care given to securing upper story windows accessible by trees, low roofs, and balconies, as well as unusual doors such as sliding glass or French doors. Fences or walls should be considered as first line for defense against intrusion. Gates should be sturdy and capable of being locked at night. Any shrubbery which could help an intruder should be removed. Exterior lighting is one of the cheapest and most effective deterrents to unauthorized entry. The lighting should illuminate the dark areas around the house, not the house itself. They should also have emergency power backup in case commercial power is cut. The techniques I have mentioned will provide you with a good level of security particularly if you also establish concentric security zones around your house, with the outer zone being the perimeter fence, the second zone being door and window locks, lights, burglar alarms, and dogs, with the inner perimeter consisting of firearms and a safe haven room. In the next tape, we'll feature individual protective measures you should be aware of when you work in a foreign country. In the first program on terrorism, we saw two Americans killed and a third taken hostage. It also contained a brief introduction to terrorism and some key points to remember when living in a foreign country. In this program, we are going to discuss some important points to be aware of in your work environment. When it comes to terrorism, every DEA special agent should have a clear understanding of the victim, profile, location, circumstances, and opportunity that increase the victim's vulnerability. 
you should know how to be a hard target. You should vary routines that establish habits. And you should follow office security precautions established to prevent terrorism. All of these interact with your daily life. But now we want to place emphasis on the working environment. Let's start with the victim. And start from the perspective that the victim is you. Any of us. And that means all of us can end up as a victim in the following ways. Victim by association, by location, or by opportunity. Victim by association. By that we mean being with a person or persons who have been selected as a target. If you had been in the grandstand when Sadat was killed, you may have been killed as well. In our country, an example would be the attack on President Reagan. The members of his staff were wounded. Victim by location. You can become a victim by being at a certain location when the attack occurs. Examples of these are if you had been visiting the judicial building in Colombia when it was taken over by the M19 terrorists. If you had been at the OL airline ticket counter at the Rome or Vienna airports, you would have simply been in the wrong place, virtually a victim by location or circumstance. And three, target of opportunity, or presenting ourselves as targets which the terrorists capitalize on. An example of this is the El Sal restaurant in El Salvador, where Americans gathered nightly. It is not uncommon for terrorist leaders to give a young terrorist a loaded automatic weapon or a hand grenade and tell him to go out and kill some Americans. For him, it is a first trial, and he looks for targets of opportunity. High-risk personnel are also high on terrorists' lists of targets. Your association with high-risk personnel is probably necessary and you should consider targets of opportunity cautions in their presence. Who are high-risk personnel? Political figures are definitely high-risk targets. Heads of state and other officials of government are always tracked by terrorist groups. Other high-risk personnel include high-ranking military officers, key businessmen, VIPs. The more important, the better. Many U.S. civilian firms operate overseas, and key executives are high on the terrorists' list, especially kidnapping for ransom money. Anyone highly visible in the performance of their work, particularly if they fail to take adequate self-protection measures. Anyone who drives an expensive privately owned vehicle or an embassy vehicle must be important. Other indicators of importance are low number license plates, chauffeurs, riding in the rear seat, bodyguards, briefcases. VIPs get and insist on red carpet treatment. Hello. Morning, I'd like Morning. to register. Okay. I'll need your signature and address, please. That will be three rooms. All one night, sir? Yes. And we'll pay in cash. Politicians never sign their name without the title. If you use American money, you reveal your nationality to both thieves and terrorists. Exchange your money for the local currency. Don't flash it around. Keep in mind that it's not your belief of importance that matters. Being an American makes you important in the eyes of the terrorist. A low profile is basic to your security and your family's security. Hey, man, how's it going? 
Sit down. Have a share of this room. Hey, can we get another glass over here for my friend? Tell me, share some of this stuff. Let's party, huh? Party. All right. What took you so long to get here? And a taxi driver had me go around circles. For yeah, hours. crazy guy. The way we talk may give us away, even if we speak the local language. Avoid the use of American slang or government acronyms. Look at these crazy people here, man. All right. That's tough, man. The way you dress can set you apart from the locals, especially when you wear loud or slogan to clothes. Wear clothes that the locals wear. Can't get a beer here. Half the man for a blue ribbon, and I got that. Can't get American beer around here. Hey, you want dance? Oh, come on. Come on. Shh. Tell you what, them unfriendly people around here, don't nobody want to have them to do with you. Strange folks, don't, I don't know, can't talk to nobody. Hey, hey, you want dance? Okay. Some of our behavior, which is accepted in the United States, does not go over well in many overseas countries. Don't be an ugly American. Don't attract attention. Keep a low profile. They are the unfriendliest people I've ever seen. Bars and nightclubs in overseas countries tend to cater to American personnel. Vary your entertainment. Keep a low profile at any function. Blend in as much as possible. In considering their selection of a target, terrorists are looking at their victims from a soft or hard point of view. A soft target is unarmed, accessible or easy to get to, predictable because of routines or patterns, unaware, complacent, not security conscious, without individual protective measures. A hard target is armed with a weapon in good working condition, with proficiency in its use and no hesitation to use it. A hardened vehicle is equipped with armor, mirrors, two-way radio, bulletproof glass, alarms, ramming kit, and locks on gas caps, hoods, and so forth. A hardened residence features armed guards, roving patrol in neighborhood, high walls or fences, intrusion devices, lights, dogs, and so forth. Communications is a two-way radio in your car, your home, and on your person. And heightened awareness is your alert attitude to what is happening around you at all times. A terrorist is not going to attack a hard target unless he has specific orders to do so. In most cases, he will pick another target. Remember that complacency kills, and nothing can be more complacent than habits and routines. All routines should be varied. Taking the same route to work, going to lunch at the same time, arriving and departing from work at the same time, going out every morning for the newspaper can get you killed. Change your routines at home as you would at work. Americans, when overseas, like the atmosphere of a certain restaurant. Change restaurants frequently. Don't go out the same night of the week. Many American families or single people set aside the same day of the week and the same place for shopping together. It's a mistake. When you go to church, work, socialize, whatever, don't park in the same place every time. Even attending church services can make you vulnerable. Try to alternate your attendance when possible. When you drive your children to school, don't leave home or pick them up at the same time and place every day. Hi. Hello, Mom. Hi. 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 How's Hi. school today? Oh, boring. So boring. Don't take the same route to and from home. Plan to be different and do it.
Some people like to stop and pick up hitchhikers. Roadside emergencies are always tempting. Americans often respond, and terrorists know that. Drive by. We are all creatures of habit, of routines. Change your life, change your times, change your routes, change your destinations if you can. Getting into a rut can be very dangerous. Um, as you can see, the northwest wing is, is the secure wing, and in case a terrorist activity should occur, uh, you should try to reach the northwest wing as soon as possible. But under no circumstances go out to the parking area. It is not a secure area, and we do not have any kind of reactionary force that will secure that area in case of a terrorist incident. Do not stay in your office area. Try to transgress to the northwest wing. When it comes to protective measures that concern your office or place of work, your security officer should have contingency plans for terrorist emergencies. Regular briefings help update the terrorist threat situation, as well as stimulating awareness. These contingency plans and reports on threat status should also be conveyed to your family if you are on an accompanied tour. If there is a terrorist episode, keep a low profile. Alert your family to do the same. Keep in mind that although you may follow all of the protective measures outlined in this program, you may become a target simply because you are a DEA special agent working in a foreign country. Remember, don't let your guard down. This videotape should provide you with some serious actions you should contemplate when working in a foreign country. The next program on terrorism will feature individual protective measures you should be aware of when you travel in a foreign country. The first two programs on terrorism illustrated how two Americans were killed and the third taken hostage. These programs featured important individual protective measures you should be aware of when you live and when you work in a foreign country. Aquí para 
Bájate, cabrón. Bájate, hijo de puta. Ándale. Ándale, muévete. Pronto, meta el orden en la casa. Ándale. Pronto. Métalo en el cuartito. In this program, we're going to discuss important individual protective measures you should be aware of when you travel in a foreign country. As a special agent for the DEA, you should have a good understanding of certain precautions you should take when you're traveling in a foreign country. This program will discuss precautions you should take when you travel by aircraft, when you travel by vehicle, or when you travel by foot. Let's look first at air travel. Aircraft hijackings are old hat operations to terrorists and actually date back to the 1930s. Worldwide popularity for this terrorist tactic was achieved in the 1960s and 70s and continues to this day. Though airport security has dramatically increased, a good terrorist operation can still locate a vulnerable airport where lax airline security can make aircraft hijacking easy. When visiting several cities, or just one city, get a detailed briefing from your regional radio officer about terrorist threats in those areas. Best routes to travel, areas to avoid, and any other information which may pertain to your safety. You should choose your travel routes carefully. Avoid dangerous airports and cities or tours that take you through countries with a known high risk of terrorism. Organize your individual protective awareness program into phases. Primary to your safety are actions you take before you ever go to the airport. If you must take a briefcase, ship it with luggage. Do not hand carry it on the aircraft. Don't dress to impress. Be comfortable for travel and be nondescript. Attention is the last thing you want. When traveling to or in a high-risk area, you should carry at least one week's supply of any essential medication of the generic type on your person. If taken hostage, explain the importance of this medication to your captors. By getting your seat assignment in advance, you can avoid lines at the ticket counter and perhaps a sudden attack. If possible, select a seat in the center of the aircraft. Sit no closer than five rows from front or rear of the plane, preferably a seat behind the emergency exit next to the window. The very front and rear of planes is a favorite place for terrorists to command from and therefore a dangerous place to be. On the other hand, by sitting one row behind the emergency exit toward the center of the aircraft, you will be a distance from the terrorist with a quick exit if necessary, but not be underfoot a rescue team if and when they enter aircraft. Your attention please, flight 367 is now boarding at gate 4A. Flight 367 is now boarding at gate 4A. Yeah, how's it going? Yeah, they just called my flight, so it's going to be about five minutes, and I need to make another call. When en route, keep your supervisor and family informed about times, routes, and destinations. Check in before you leave and when you arrive. You should have contact names and phone numbers of people to contact en route or who will meet you at your destination.
Select a place to wait, which gives you a commanding view of the area. You must be alert to events occurring in the proximity to your person at all times. Whatever it takes, spend the least amount of time you can at airports. But don't get on the plane early. Board at the last possible moment. Once on board, keep your seatbelt on at all times when seated. If an explosion occurs, you'll be less likely to be sucked out of the aircraft. Keep in mind also that name tags, stenciling, or decals on luggage will identify you. All a terrorist has to do is wait to see who picks up the luggage and follow him. Now let's look at vehicle travel. Vehicles are ideal terrorist targets. Vehicle transportation places a target in jeopardy before, during, or even after the move is made. Bombings, assassinations, assaults, kidnappings are all part of the terrorist tactical capability. Your first concern before getting into the car is to search it for a bomb. You are looking for telltale signs, such as pieces of tape, wires, scuff marks, any signs of tampering, anything foreign on, near, around, or under the vehicle. Start your visual inspection at the front of the car. Look carefully at the grill, hood release, bumper. Look carefully at the tires, wheel well, vent window, gas cap, door latch, weather stripping. Visually check the trunk, exhaust pipe, bumper. Pay particular attention to the exhaust system, chassis, drivetrain, gas tank. It takes a specially trained bomb squad four and a half hours to do a thorough search of a car. If you suspect anything. Walk away. Report your suspicions immediately. Remember that a careful visual search may save your life and it can also alert the terrorist that you are security conscious. The terrorists may elect to choose a more unsuspecting target. When you are traveling in your vehicle, either as a driver or a passenger, be cautious at all times. Stay mentally alert to what is going on around you. Keep your mind ahead two or three blocks and play what-if games as you drive. Don't drive and drink coffee or smoke or listen to the radio. If you are carrying work papers, they should be in the trunk. Terrorists use hit-and-run tactics and do not take the time to search vehicles. If possible, don't drive the same car all the time. You do not want to be identified with a vehicle. Always use your safety belts, not only for collision safety, but for protection in the event you have to ram through a roadblock or become involved in a high-speed chase. Drive with doors locked and your windows closed. Terrorists have walked up to cars, stopped at traffic lights, opened doors, and shot people or dragged them out of the car. It does little good to have special equipment, no security measures, and then not use them. In a high-risk area, if you suspect a setup, don't stop, even if you were involved in a fender-bender type of accident. Proceed to your place of work or residence and report to the proper authorities immediately. 
If you are stopped by a policeman of a foreign country, don't get out of the car. If asked for your driver's license, crack your window just enough to hand him the license. What the hell's going on up here? I don't know. Looks like a couple of cars sitting in the middle of the road to me. It's kind of unusual for here, isn't it? Uh, yeah. I mean, the last time we came down this way, I didn't see anybody sitting in the roadway. If you approach a police roadblock, do so with extreme care, especially in a high-risk terrorist area. It may very well be legitimate. On the other hand, it may be a terrorist ruse. Ask yourself some quick questions. One, was it there the last time you traveled this way? Two, are the weapons and uniforms the same for all the officers? Three, are there suspicions concerning the vehicles? Four, are they checking traffic in both directions? Make your approach very carefully. And remember, if you determine that the situation is threatening, never stop. Get away quickly. keep your vehicle in good working order and keep your gas tank full never allow it to drop below the half full mark we've talked about air travel about vehicle travel now let's look at pedestrian travel train yourself to walk facing traffic at all times terrorists like to attack from behind and by walking toward traffic, you have put the oncoming vehicles between you and a potential assailant. If they try to hit you from the front, you'll be able to see the terrorists and their weapons as they approach. Be alert when walking across the front of an alley where an assailant could be hiding. If you ever have any doubts about walking through an area, don't. Periodically, you should check behind you to see if you're being followed. If you are being followed, take appropriate action quickly. Training in surveillance and counter-surveillance will help you in this area. Avoid walking in noisy areas, such as a construction site. The noise can serve as a distraction for a terrorist attack. When you travel, hotels have unique vulnerabilities, and you should know and follow the rules of individual protective awareness concerning them. If a room has been reserved for you before your arrival, request another room. Uh, I wonder if I might have um, a room on the sixth floor near the back, if you have it, please. Sure. The two and six and three. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Have a nice day. Thank you. There may be others who know which rooms are being reserved for incoming Americans. Avoid street-level rooms, because they're easily accessible, and it is not difficult to throw something through the window. You should know all emergency exits and the locations of fire extinguishers. Get a room between the second and tenth floor. If there is a fire or a bombing or a firefight, local emergency equipment seldom reach above the tenth floor. While you're in your room, keep your door locked with a deadbolt if available. Remember, others have keys to your room. You may wish to use other means to block the door in a high-risk area. Keep your draperies closed. 
do not at any time admit strangers. Particular emphasis should be placed on keeping your room and personal effects in a neat and orderly fashion. This will help you recognize tampering or strange out of place objects. If you, leave your... if you leave your room in the day and expect to return after dark, make sure your draperies are closed and the lights on. This will allow you to return without having to turn on lights and close draperies, which could expose you to sniper fire. Make sure your key is in your pocket at all times. Vary your arrivals and departures, your exits and entrances. Taxis. If you need a taxi when you leave your hotel, don't take the first taxi in line. It could be terrorists waiting, especially if they know you use taxis. Take the second or third in line, or even better, walk away from the hotel and flag down a taxi at random. Terrorism is a fact of life in the world today. Advanced planning, caution, alert observation, contingency reactions, common sense, are elements which provide you with good individual protection awareness. Terrorism uses complacency as a foremost weapon. Your indifference is their ammunition in that weapon. You must expect terrorism and work to stay alive. This program should have provided you with important information to remember when traveling in a foreign country. Unfortunately, in spite of all the protective measures that you may take, Becoming a hostage is still a possibility. The next and last program on terrorism awareness is designed to help you increase your chances of survival if you are taken hostage. So far in this series on terrorism, we have featured important individual protective measures you should be aware of when you live, when you work, and when you travel in a foreign country. Vamos a hacerle algunas preguntas. Exacto, lo del cuartito. Eh, bueno, 
Ciao, vente para acá. Siéntate. Siéntate ahí. How long have you been in this country? How long have you been in this country? Who are your contacts here? Who are your contacts in the government? How long have you been in this country? How long have you been in this country? Who are your contacts here? Who are your contacts in the government? In Sierra Law. In this program, we are going to discuss important information which could save your life if taken hostage. As long as we value human life, hostage taking will be an effective method of gaining control and obtaining media coverage for the terrorist. More often than not, the primary target is a government, a business organization, or a community. In this regard, the hostage becomes a secondary victim, merely a bargaining chip. A hostage is selected for many reasons. He is valuable, he is prominent, and he will elicit widespread publicity. Who are hostage takers? Political extremists fill a large block in terrorist society. They're usually from upper or upper middle class families with backgrounds and personality styles that tend to vary from country to country. Their parents are usually politically active but not violently politically active. They're difficult to deal with for their bright, and their plans are extensive, intricate, and complete. They tend to be abnormally idealistic, inflexible, and often they are willing to die for their cause. The farther down in the ranks one looks, the wider the range of personality styles one begins to see. There are the disillusioned, the mentally ill, the ideologically motivated, the sociopaths who have been recruited from prisons, the mercenaries who become terrorists for money. All are usually led by a political extremist. Extremists who are not likely to give up their hostages unless their own escape to friendly territory is guaranteed to their satisfaction. If taken hostage by a political extremist, do not discuss politics. If he wants to talk about politics and his cause, show interest even if you are not sincere. Explain to him that you might not agree with him, but that you are interested in his point of view. Don't argue with him. Do not get emotional and start begging and crying. The terrorist doesn't want to hear it, because you probably represent everything he's against. Another type of hostage taker is the fleeing criminal. He may take hostages on impulse to avoid immediate apprehension. He does not want to die. He often does not want to kill a hostage, particularly if there has been no previous murder. He tends to be impulsive and often will settle for much less than originally demanded if he perceives his power eroding slowly and is allowed to give up with dignity. Too sudden loss of power can create agitation, despair, or panic and impulsive killing of a hostage can occur. In most cases, time is on the side of a peaceful resolution. The wronged person type of hostage taker seeks to notify society about defects in the system or establishment because of some disagreeable experience. I want to kill myself, okay? I want to hurt myself, okay? Do you want to hurt innocent people? I'm the innocent. I want to hurt myself more than the others. You've got other people, too. Okay, you know why the people find out that I'm a suffer? He is usually seeking redress of the experience or publicity of that wrong. He, in effect, tries to take justice in his own hands. 
group dynamics can complicate this situation because there may be a group of people who have suffered similar injustice who may create backing and support for the hostage taker. Best I can tell you right now, he's been fired from the Hilton very recently. He's got some kind of back injury, so hear him out and, and humor him. The wronged person is usually motivated by a wish for revenge. The hostage may represent the system, the establishment, or whatever the wronged person wishes to avenge. Media restraint is critical to this type of hostage incident, for the hostage is in a dangerous situation. Gentle persuasion is required to convince the wronged person that what he needs to end the situation will be provided. The religious fanatic type hostage taker poses a very high risk to the hostage throughout the incident. The hostage takers will claim to be operating on divine orders. They are very defensive about their religion and they may be suicidal to the point that to die for their religion is to succeed in the holiest achievement possible. That the long-awaited Messiah is here. Now the proof that's going to follow is that whenever you walk out here, your cameras are going to be on us. We're going to let the hostages go. We're going to step outside and uh, we're going to be shot to death by the police officers. What's that going to prove? Well, I, what you have here is I want you to put this over the news nationwide. And whenever three and a half days comes, I want you guys to be here for the resurrection. Why is it necessary to be shot to do something like this? Well, you've got to be dead. You know, see, we've conquered the world within us. We're conquering the world now on the outside of us. Now all we have left to conquer is death. You must understand the hostage taker's belief system and manipulate logic from within that system. This hostage taker requires time, patience, sensitivity. If taken hostage by a religious fanatic, do not attempt to change his religious belief as a method of gaining your freedom. If you don't have a religion, make one up. Because their belief is that every man should have a religion. And if you don't, you are nothing but a faceless symbol. The mentally disturbed hostage taker. Over 50% of all United States hostage takers are mentally disturbed. The hostage taking may be spontaneous or planned. Many of these people have intermittent periods of lucidity in the psychosis. Often it may take an extended period of contact before mental disturbance is revealed in the hostage taker's speech. Delusions or hallucinations probably will not impair his ability to do what he wants to do with the hostage holding situation. Rapport may be difficult to achieve and maintain, but the efforts to do so should be consistent. Almost always, the mentally ill hostage taker acts alone. He is capable of hurting hostages, and he may have a death wish that can be satisfied by the murder of the hostage, suicide, or both. Every attempt to establish rapport with this hostage taker should be made. In cases where several hostages are being held, rapport may be the deciding factor that saves the hostage's life when it comes time to execute a hostage because demands were not met. Some ways to establish rapport may be through eye contact, greetings, or smiling. Make an attempt to start conversations with the terrorist. Talk about your family. If you are carrying photos of family members, show him the photos. A new threat which has grown during the past few years is narco-terrorism. It is doubly dangerous because often it combines drug criminals with political terrorists and guerrillas. The billionaire narcotics bosses of Latin America, hurting from the pressure applied to their drug smuggling into the U.S., have begun to strike at United States officials and businessmen and officials of their own governments. They hire criminal elements to conduct assassinations, bombings, 
kidnappings, and other terrorist activities. If you are taken hostage by one of these hired criminals, you should consider escape regardless of risk or the prospect of violence. Narco-terrorists have the same history as Central or Latin American terrorists of no concession and torture with ultimate death. Escape at the moment of capture may be the only way of survival. Your survival as a hostage may well be determined by the correct analysis of the category of hostage taker which fits your situation. It will be the basis for any method you employ to assist you in your safe release. We will now look at courses of action you should take before capture, action you should consider at the time of capture, how to endure captivity, and things to contemplate if you are planning an escape. If you are going overseas, your personal contingency planning should be a priority concern, particularly if your assignment will take you to a high-risk terrorist environment. Take care of your personal affairs and maintain them in good order. And all I want to do is just show you what's in here so that in the event that anything happens, um, you'll know kind of uh, where everything is and you won't have to be running around doing everything. Um, got the will and everything drawn up, and that's all of the insurance papers. They're all together, too. And this is a list uh, of the, um, the house and what to do with that. You may wish to have a packet made up containing instructions, money, airline tickets, credit cards, insurance policies, and names of those to contact for survival assistance overseas. The contents of your briefcase or items carried on your person can cause you great difficulty if you are taken hostage. Classified or sensitive or potentially embarrassing items should not be carried in your briefcase or on your person. If you are taken hostage, be prepared to explain phone numbers, addresses, names, and other items carried at the time of capture. A compromising document or item can destroy your argument that you are an innocent victim. Now, let's look at the moment of capture. You should consider that the initial moment of a capture is the most dangerous time of the event because the terrorists are tense and their adrenaline is flowing. In these circumstances, terrorists may commit unintentional violence at the slightest provocation. When faced with well-armed and determined terrorists, it is unrealistic to believe that a hostage can escape. Faced with these overwhelming odds, it is vital not to panic or try any sudden movement which may excite an already anxious gunman. Remember that the assailant meticulously planned and executed the operation to apprehend the hostage. The initiative, time, location, and circumstances of the attack favor the terrorist. The manpower and firepower brought to bear in the incident leave the hostage with very little opportunity to escape. Terrorists often use blindfolds or hoods on victims. One reason is to prevent the hostage from being able to identify other terrorists. Gags are often used to prevent the hostage from attracting attention by shouting or screaming. Sometimes the terrorists themselves wear masks or hoods. It is not wise to try to remove your blindfold or the hood of your captors. If the terrorists feel you can identify them, they may be forced to kill you. In any case, this moment is not the time to agitate the hostage takers. It is important to keep in mind that the terrorists want you alive. If they use blindfolds, gags, or drugs at the time of abduction, you should not be alarmed or resist unduly. Struggling is likely to result in even more severe physical abuse measures. What you should do is stay very alert and use your mind. Occupy your senses by noting sounds, direction of movement, passage of time, conversations among the terrorists, and any other information or circumstances which may save your life or the lives of other hostages if you are released or escape. Now, you've been captured. Let's talk about enduring captivity. 
to increase your chances of enduring captivity, it is important that you understand the Stockholm Syndrome. On Thursday, August 23, 1973, the quiet early routines of the Savaris Credit Bank in Stockholm, Sweden, was destroyed by the chatter of a submachine gun. A 32-year-old thief, burglar, and prison escapee, Jan Erik Olsen, started the hostage situation which resulted in the discovery of a psychological phenomenon given the name the Stockholm Syndrome. Three women, ranging in age from 21 to 31 years old, and one male, 25 years old, were held hostage for 131 hours. Their jail was an 11 by 47 foot carpeted bank vault. Soon, they were joined by another criminal and former cellmate of Olsen. Clark Olofsson, age 26, joined the group after Olsen had demanded his release from prison by threatening to kill hostages unless he was delivered to the bank. This particular hostage situation gained long-lasting notoriety, primarily because the electronic media exploited the victim as well as the sequence of events. Contrary to what had been expected, it was found out that the victims feared the police more than the criminals. For many weeks after this incident, and while under the care of psychiatrists, the hostages puzzled over their feelings. Why don't we hate the kidnappers? They, in fact, felt that the bank robbers had given them their lives back and were emotionally indebted to the bank robbers for their generosity. This phenomenon, the Stockholm Syndrome, seems to be an automatic, probably unconscious emotional response to the trauma of becoming a victim. It is not the rational choice of a victim who decides consciously that the most advantageous behavior in the predicament is to befriend his captor. It is a positive bond, born in, or perhaps because of, the stress of the siege room, which serves to unite its victims against the outside world. It is the philosophy of us against them, which develops subconsciously between the hostages and the terrorists. It is also a syndrome that has been observed around the world in many hostage situations. It is important to note that this positive bond, the Stockholm Syndrome, seems to be a bond beyond the control of the hostage and the terrorist. This syndrome is a phenomenon you should recognize when it begins. Use it to your advantage. Terrorists often drug their victims, usually at the beginning of a hostage-taking operation. In most cases, this is done early on to put the hostage to sleep or keep him pacified. At this stage, the life of the hostage is important to the terrorists. As a hostage, you may be subjected to interrogation. Terrorist interrogators are highly trained individuals thoroughly knowledgeable in intelligence, in psychological warfare, in individual interrogation techniques, and in political and propaganda manipulation. Enduring captivity will be the result of you accepting many factors that deviate far from the routine. Among the most important of these factors are living conditions. Kidnapped victims have often been forced to live in makeshift people's prisons. These people's cells can be quite small and in some cases prevent the hostage from standing or moving around. Hostages have been held for days where excessive heat and lack of adequate water, food and toilet facilities have been almost unbearable. Remember that a process of humanization can take place when a hostage and terrorist are locked together in the same place. You must build empathy by maintaining respect and dignity. The fact is that it is hard for a capture to inflict pain on a humanized situation. It is easier to hurt or kill someone you don't know. In some instances, toilet facilities may not be provided, and the hostage may be forced to soil his living space, his clothing, his own body. There may be a total lack of privacy and a feeling of utter helplessness. This is what the terrorist wants. Dehumanization is the terrorist's basic tactic. 
Under these conditions, the very difficult to achieve, self-respect and dignity may be the key to retaining human being status in the eyes of the terrorist. Every attempt should be made to establish rapport with the terrorists while maintaining your dignity and self-respect. It is hard, if not impossible, however, to develop rapport if you are held in isolation. Terrorists also know about the Stockholm Syndrome and are isolating hostages more and more because of that very reason. One caution, do not, under any circumstances, try to aid the terrorist negotiator. Trained people are probably trying to help you. Your attempts to enter the area of negotiations can be very confusing, and often a big problem for the very people who are trying to rescue you. Accept it. Terrorist interrogators are experts. Never forget that the interrogator is your enemy. He is there to exploit you. We have talked about things you should do before capture, how you should act at the time of capture, attitudes you should adopt during captivity. Now let's talk about escape. Escape is the highest form of resistance. A successful escape depends on your ability to recognize escape opportunities and your reaction to them. Immediate decision and instant action are crucial to a successful escape. Basically, there are three types of escape. First, an escape of opportunity, which is conducted in the initial and movement phases of captivity. Now, the escape is made possible by lack of attention, a lack of security, by a diversion, or by overpowering guards. The second type of escape is a planned escape. This is an escape made with careful consideration given to the means or ways of escape, the routes of escape, and an evasive plan of action for staying free after the escape. The third type of escape is an escape of desperation. Escape must be contemplated when there is no chance of surviving captivity because of long-term food or medical denial, or a situation where death is inevitable. Escape of desperation may be necessary and attempted in all phases of a hostage incident. Green light next time anyone comes out. Go on the flashback. Look, just give us the information we want. This is going to be the last time we talk to you. Give us the information. We need this information. Who are your contacts in the government? Give us information we need. Oye, mundo, ¿viste algo? No, ni nada. Our man is in the first room on the right. Hostages who die are killed during rescue attempts. 
It is, therefore, crucial for you to be especially alert, cautious, and obedient in instruction should you or the terrorists suspect that any rescue attempt is imminent or is taking place. If the doors come flying open, followed by rescue forces, drop to the floor immediately. Lie as flat as you can and freeze. Do not attempt to run. You may be shot by those who are trying to rescue you, or you might be shot by the terrorists for trying to escape. Do not, under any circumstances, pick up a gun and try to help the rescue party. You most certainly will be shot by the rescue forces who will presume you to be a terrorist. DEA agents here in Bogota work out of the heavily guarded U.S. Embassy. They are constant targets of death threats. Traffickers here make no secret that they will pay a $300,000 reward for the killing of any DEA agent. This agent goes through an unbelievable routine every morning simply to get to work. I would have my car, my chase car, waiting downstairs. The escorts, armed with Uzi machine guns, shield the agent's walk from the front door of his home to the curb. The fear of death is such that security like this is routine. One car behind and the other in front to run interference. The route to work is changes every day. We have to be on our guard at all times uh, to make sure that a motorcycle is not sneaking up to your right or left of your vehicle. Motorcycles are often used by assassins in Colombia. One man drives, the other makes the kill. The drive ends the same way it began, with guards up front jumping out to protect the final turn. Drive right into the compound, and not leave work unless it's something very urgent till that evening. We just start the routine over the next day. Agents are vulnerable on the street and in their hotel rooms. One evening uh, we got a knock at the door and there were several armed men outside the door identifying themselves as police officers and they were demanding entry into our room. DEA pilot Charlie Martinez and his partner Kelly McCullough were staying in this hotel in Cartagena. Charlie said that he was going to have to open the door for them and let them in because if he didn't they told him that they were going to shoot the door down. The men at the door that night were not policemen but the drug dealers themselves. They took us out of the hotel at gunpoint, drove us out to the countryside and attempted to kill my partner and I, uh, shooting us several times. I started running toward the ditch alongside the highway and I heard the gun go off behind me and heard Charlie scream and I figured that he was in bad shape, if not dead. The man chasing McCullough fired twice, hitting him in the knee and hip. I was trying to get back up. He stood over me and shot me in the neck and it knocked me down on the ground. Both agents were left for dead. By morning, McCullough had somehow managed to walk three miles and caught a bus back to a Cartagena hospital. Hours later, he learned that Martinez had also survived. DEA agent Victor Cortez had been in Guadalajara, Mexico, just eight months, investigating the murder of a fellow drug agent when a Mexican police officer approached his car. The next thing he knew, he was ordered into a car at gunpoint and taken to police headquarters and locked in a cell. Victor was investigating the murder of fellow agent Enrique Camarena and his pilot. Their bodies were discovered on a ranch outside of Guadalajara in March of 84. Agent Camarena had been tortured and beaten to death and his pilot buried alive. Camarena was murdered by Mexican traffickers. But what infuriated officers at the U.S. consulate was the role six Mexican police officers played during their kidnapping and delivery to drug lords. Victor Cortez was in fact interrogated about the role of the Drug Enforcement Administration uh, in Mexico, about the individuals uh, who were suspects in the abduction and murder of Kiki Camarena, and it became very clear to us that individuals uh, within the Guadalajara Police Department were in fact on the payroll of the traffickers. When Cortez refused to answer their questions, the officers dragged in the electrical wires. It was a very excruciating pain. At one point, uh, my whole body jolted and I hit myself hard, my head against uh, the concrete wall. And I wanted to knock myself completely out because I couldn't stand the pain. My 
one of these people to just put a gun to my head and, and kill me. The pain was so great, I can't explain to you uh, how great it was, but I can tell you that uh, I wanted to die. Uh, they told me they were gonna kill me. They told me that uh, the same thing that happened to Camarena was gonna happen to me, and that they were gonna take me out to the countryside once it got dark. After they got whatever they wanted, or they got tired, they left me. But they told me, this is just the beginning, we'll be back. It was dark outside when a guard came back to the cell and led him downstairs. I'm thinking I need to escape. When we got down to the hallway, I began looking around to see where the nearest uh, exit was. And in doing so, I saw uh, one of the uh, DEA agents in the office and it was a sight of relief that i have never experienced before after six hours in custody it was finally over a dea supervisor had refused to leave until cortez was turned over it is a fact that 96 percent of all hostages live to walk out of the ordeal this series of programs has been extended to alert you to the potential dangers inherent in certain assignments and to show ways to minimize your risks. As you are probably aware and can tell from the discussion of real life incidents which you have just seen, each of you must be responsible for your own safety at all times. If taken hostage, you must maintain a positive attitude towards survival. You must keep your will to survive.